It is an absolute joy and privilege to be here. It is amazing what God is doing um, with Dreaming the Impossible. So I count it a privilege to be here. As I arrived on site, I had a flashback because it's a glorious day, right? How many of you have had a water fight this afternoon? Okay, okay, some of you have. When the weather's this good, it'd be rude not to. But I remember a few years ago, Camping with my family, it was at New Wine, another Christian festival, glorious hot day. Our church, KXC, were camping and other churches were camped around us and a water fight broke out on our campsite and all the young kids were getting involved, lots of excitement with their water pistols running around. And then the water fight began to spread and other churches got involved and other young kids were running around shooting each other with these water pistols. And then some of the adults started to get involved. And there was this one pastor, actually from a vineyard church, it's always the vineyard that do stuff like this, from a vineyard church, he got a bucket of water and was just walking around looking for someone to pour it upon. Now, my son was only five or six at the time, completely unaware of this vineyard pastor. This vineyard pastor walks right up beside him and then pours the whole thing on his head. Now, my son burst into tears, said a few things that aren't biblical and then ran towards his tent. And I could see all this unfold. And I was like, oh no, that's not gonna have gone down well. So I go running after him. I check he's okay. He's a little bit upset, but we move on. Anyway, that night we get to the evening meeting. And at the end of the evening meeting, this vineyard pastor comes up to me and says, hey, Pete, I just wanna apologise. I think I really upset your son. I was trying to downplay it. I was like, nah, honestly, he saw the funny side of it. Like, no problem, he was okay. And the vineyard pastor said, no, I don't think he was okay. I think he was really upset and I feel really bad. And again, I try and downplay it. Don't, he was fine. He could see the funny side. And then he said, no, Pete, he wrote me a letter. (laughs) And then he pulls out of his jacket this letter. Now, I'm having a mild panic as I see this letter like pulled out of the jacket and I'm beginning to pray and dream, I'm dreaming for the impossible, that maybe this letter says something, Dear Sir, you did upset me this afternoon, but my mum and dad have been teaching me about the power of forgiveness and I'm choosing to extend forgiveness and grace towards you. Your great sins have been forgiven separated from you as far as the East is from the West. I was dreaming for that kind of letter. Let me just let you know, it wasn't that kind of letter. It was a really short letter. It went something like this. I hope you die. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it was an embarrassing moment. I mean, fairly articulate for a five-year-old and a great way to express the raw emotion of it, but a I've learnt my lesson. I don't get involved in water fights at camping festivals, particularly Christian camping festivals. Um, That story's got nothing to do with my preach this evening. So why don't we just welcome the Spirit of the living God? We're gonna be talking about the love of the Father. We've been singing about the love of the Father. And in Romans chapter five, it says, the love of the Father is poured into our hearts by the Spirit. So wherever the Spirit of God is active and My word, is He active tonight? Wherever the Spirit of God is active, He's pouring out the love of the Father into our hearts. So can we just have a moment of stillness? You might wanna close your eyes, just hold out your hands in expectation of receiving a gift. The gift that I'm praying that we will receive tonight is an experience of the love of the Father. So Holy Spirit, would you come and pour out the love of the Father in this place? We don't wanna just intellectually understand more of your love. We want to experience with the entirety of our beings more of your love tonight. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to start by telling you a story about Abraham Lincoln. This story goes back um, before he was the president um, in the United States of America. So he was the president in the 1860s. So this is before that. And he was travelling around different towns and cities in the US And he was visiting this one town and he stumbled into a slave auction. Now, this is when slave auctions were the norm. So he stumbled into this slave auction and he stood at the back. This was a fairly standard slave auction. People were bidding for different types of slaves. And then something happened in this gathering. The mood began to change. He could tell the atmosphere shifted in this place. And he looked around and suddenly realised what was going on. These young 
girls were being paraded through the room and they were gonna be sold off as sex slaves. Now, Abraham Lincoln standing at the back of this room was outraged, livid by what he was witnessing. Anyway, the auctioneer brought the first girl up on stage and someone put in the first bid and the men in the room started cheering and jeering and anger was rising in Abraham Lincoln. Like, I hate this. How could we be doing this? Anyway, the next bid went in, more cheers, more shouting. And then from the back of the room, Abraham Lincoln thought, I'm gonna do something about this. And he shouted from the back of the room and the place went completely still. And what he shouted was he offered a bid for this slave girl that was like crazy high, more than anyone in the room could possibly match. And everyone looked to the back of the room like, who is this guy? And if he's willing to pay that amount of money, what is he gonna do to the slave girl? Now imagine the slave girl, she's trembling. No one can match the bid. So the auctioneer points the slave girl towards Abraham Lincoln like this is your new owner. And she walks to the back of the room and everyone's watching. The girl, Abraham Lincoln, the girl, like what's gonna happen? And she arrives and she stands before him and he looks her in the eye and he says, you're free to go now. And she just can't compute what's happening. She's like, what, what? you've paid like crazy money for me. What, what do you mean? And she's trying to process it. And she says, well, am I free to go wherever I wanna go? He says, yeah, you're free to go wherever you wanna go. She's still wrestling to understand what's happening in this encounter. Well, am I free to go with whoever I wanna go with? And he's like, yeah, you're free to go with whoever you wanna go with. You are free to go. She takes another minute to process what's happening. And then she responds with this. Well, if I'm truly free to go, I want to go with you. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. Incredible story. If you ask any follower of Jesus about how they came to faith, there's going to be 101 different answers. But at the root of every answer will be something like this. When I understood what Christ had done for me to purchase my freedom, to communicate His love for me, I just wanted to be around Him. I wanted to follow after Him. I wanted to experience more of that love. You see, this is the primary message for tonight, that your identity in Christ is that you are free and you are loved. You are free and you are loved. Turn to the person next to you, just speak it over them. You are free and you are loved. There we go. Excitement levels rising in the room. Now here's the thing. Most followers of Jesus... Most followers of Jesus believe that to be true, right? Most followers of Jesus believe that to be true, but there is a gap between head knowledge and heart knowledge. We believe things at times we haven't fully experienced. But when you experience freedom in Christ and when you experience the love of the Father, it transforms you from the inside out. Let me tell you another story. This is a story of a guy called Robert Cornwall. His brother was a famous Pentecostal preacher called Judson Cornwall. Um, And Robert Cornwall was a pastor in a small town in Oregon. And he basically decided he wanted to volunteer some of his time to serve at the local hospital. So he rocks up at the local hospital, says, look, I'm a priest like nearby and I'd love to just give some of my time to volunteer and serve in whatever way I can. And he began this conversation with the, the warden of the hospital. And basically said, is there anything I can do that would practically help you guys out? And the warden said, well, not much comes to mind, but there is this one thing, come follow me. So he walks Robert Cornwall down this corridor, down another corridor, and they end up at this big door with locks all the way down the side of the door. And above the door, it says room 37. Now inside room 37, 
were 37 patients with severe mental health needs. They were incapacitated. They'd been medicated on drugs just to calm them down. This was a long time ago. And they didn't know what to do with these patients. So they put them in a padded cell and locked them up. And every so often would just provide, you know, for their immediate needs. But they had no idea how to help these patients out. And the warden said to, to Robert Cornwall, could you just spend some time with these patients? And he's like, yeah, fine. So they unlocked you know, all these locks, opened the door and Robert Cornwall walks in. He's like, oh my goodness. Because they were so high on their meds, they weren't able to engage with him. So he's like, I don't even know what to do, how to begin a conversation. What do I do? There's literally excrement everywhere, urine along the sides of the wall. So he says to God, like, I don't know what to do. Like, help, what should I do? How do I spend this next hour that I have in room 37? And he senses God say to him this, just sing over the patients, right? So he finds a spot on the floor where there's no excrement, no urine, sits down. He says, God, like, what do I sing? And then this song comes to mind and he begins to sing it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That's 20 seconds. He had a full hour. I was like, I'll go again. Yes. He sings. The, oh, you were getting involved then. Yeah, love it. For the full hour, he just sings that refrain. Anyway, at the end of the hour, the warden returns, opens the locks, opens the door. Thanks so much for giving your time. What a gift. And Robert Cornwall goes home. He's like, wow, what was that? A week goes by. He rocks up at the hospital. I'd like to give some time, anything I can do. And the warden says, yes, come with me. Go down the corridor, arrive back at room 37, undo all the locks, open the door. Could you spend an hour with these patients? Robert Cornwall walks in. God, what do I do? God says the same thing. Why don't you sit down and just sing over them? So he sits down. Yes, Jesus loves me. Imagine singing that for a full hour. Woo. Anyway, week three, same thing happens. And as he's singing, this large lady stands up and begins to walk towards him. He's in the middle of this room and he's suddenly intimidated like, oh my goodness, is anyone aware of this? Like, how do I call for help? What's she gonna do? Do you know what she does? She sits down next to him and joins the chorus, two of them. Yes, Jesus loves me. Week by week, the patients get involved. This is a true story. At the end of six months, all 37 were out of room 37 and on self-help wards. At the end of the year, 36 out of the 37 had been discharged from hospital and were worshipping in his local church. How incredible is that? Incredible. Now, there are easier ways to grow a local church, right? There are easier ways to grow a local church. But the amazing thing about that story is the transformative power of love. They weren't transformed by an idea, just growing their intellectual understanding. They were transformed by an encounter with the love of the Father. When head knowledge becomes heart knowledge, it transforms your life. This is one of the great tragedies in the church. So many people believe in the love of the Father but haven't experienced the love of the Father. So there's a chasm between head knowledge and heart knowledge. But when the Spirit moves and the love of the Father is poured into our hearts and we encounter the love of God, it transforms us from the inside out. Right, so I wanna share another story. This one is from the Gospels. This is the story of the prodigal son that I know we've been singing about and Zeke and Susie preached on it from night one. So we're gonna re-engage in the story of the prodigal son. A reminder, this son rejects dad, brings shame on the family name, basically says, I wanna take my inheritance early. And he takes it and he spends it on reckless living. He hits rock bottom. A famine sweeps through the land. Um, and he's about to, because he's so hungry, he's working on this farm. He's about to tuck in to the food that belongs to the pigs. That's when you know you've hit rock bottom. If that happens later in life, that's when you know you've hit rock bottom, when you're about to tuck into the food that belongs to the pigs. And that's the moment he has this revelation, I should go back to my father. 
Like he was a gracious father. I've brought so much shame on him and the family name. I could never go back as a son, but maybe I could go back as a hired servant. So he rehearses this speech as he begins to walk home. You know, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired servants. And you know how the story ends, right? The father sees the son from a distance, runs towards him and you have this incredible moment of reconciliation, this incredible moment of the embrace of the father, experiencing the love of the father. Now, I wanna unpack this story from a slightly fresh angle, right? This is a very Jewish story. And for a lot of us, we don't understand the richness of this story because of the culture gap between the first century and the context we're in, the 21st century. So I wanna help us understand this story as the crowd listening to Jesus would have understood the story. So we need to enter the mindset of a first century Jew in the crowd listening to Jesus. Are you ready for that? Oh, low levels of readiness. Low levels. Are you ready for that? Okay, so let's do that. There's three things you need to know to enter the mindset of a first century Jew in the crowd listening to Jesus tell the story. Here's the first thing you need to know then. That Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people in the Old Testament, they have a title. And the title they are given by God is God's Son. So you remember the Exodus story when Moses goes to Pharaoh to liberate the people, the message that God gives to Moses, you're to say this to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. Well done. Israel is my firstborn son, let my son go. Now, if you follow the story then of God's son, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, they reject God, their father, And as a result, they end up in exile in Babylon in a far off land. Now, if you fast forward to the first century, to the time of Jesus, they've returned from Babylon to Jerusalem, but they're still not free to be the people they were created by God to be. Like the Romans were ruling over them, crushing their identity. The deep longing of the Jewish people in the first century is we wanna be reconciled to our Father because we know in relationship with God, His blessings flow from Him to us and we come alive. We wanna be reconciled with our Father. So when Jesus, this prophet, this rabbi, tells a story of a son rejecting a father, ending up in a far off land and trying to get home, everyone in the crowd would have been like, He's telling us our story. We rejected God as Father. We worshipped other gods. We ended up in Babylon. We wanna be reconciled. Maybe Jesus is gonna give us some clues how to be reconciled to God, to live life fully. Everyone would have been leaning in. I wanna listen to this prophet. I wanna listen to this rabbi. First thing you need to know, Israel is the lost son. Here's the second thing you need to know. In the first century in Middle Eastern culture, there was a ceremony known as the Kezazar ceremony. Now the Kezazar ceremony went something like this. If a son rejected the father in the way that this son in the story did and and left the family bringing shame on the wider community, if that son ever tried to come home, ever dared to come home, the people of the village would line up on the threshold of the village and there would be this showdown. And they would take a clay pot and they would smash it on the floor. It would break into hundreds of pieces. And this was a symbolic way of saying, our relationship with you is like that clay pot. It's broken. It's in hundreds of pieces. It's irredeemable. The word Kezazar literally means to cut off. We are cutting you off from this community because you brought shame on your father and shame on the wider community. It was a brutal ceremony. So when Jesus tells the story of this son, the crowd would have been leaning in. This is our story, but panic might have been setting in. Oh my goodness, is Jesus about to tell us that God's gonna perform a Kezazar ceremony on us? We rejected him 
and brought shame on him. And maybe now this is gonna be a revenge moment where he cuts us off from his presence. And if we're cut off from his presence, we can never live life fully. So a level of nervousness would have been merging as they were listening to Jesus tell the story. Is there gonna be a Kezazar ceremony? Like clay pot treatment. Here's the third thing you need to know to enter the mindset of a first century Jew listening to Jesus tell the story. And it's this, that dignified Jewish fathers would never run. Like you would walk in a dignified manner, a bit like this, but you would not run. Because to run, you'd have to hitch up your robes, expose your bare legs. And in that culture, that was completely shameful to do that. I mean, I've got lovely legs here. But in the context of the first century, that would have been completely shameful to do. So male slaves would run and boys would run, but Jewish fathers would never run. So I want you to have these three things in the back of your mind. Israel is the lost son. Jesus is telling them their story. Secondly, everyone's waiting for a Kezazar ceremony, clay pot treatment. Thirdly, dignified Jewish fathers don't run. Okay, now let's piece those things together. Where is the power and the punch in this story? And the power and the punch in the story is that everyone's expecting the Kezazar ceremony, the moment where the father gets revenge on the son. But if you read the text of Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son, the lost son, you won't read about any clay pots. You won't read about any Kezazar ceremony. There isn't a moment where the son is humiliated. Why? And the answer is because the father is the one that humiliates himself in the place of the son. It's the father who hitches up his robes and starts running. In that context, it would have been like, oh, what is he doing? So the question you and I should be asking is, why did the father need to run? Even if he was gonna forgive his son, why can't he sort of move in a moody fashion, listen to the speech, let the son grovel? That's what I would do. I just hear the speech, I want you to feel the pain. But the father doesn't do that. It says in the text that he watches and he waits on his land, hoping for one day the son to return. We don't know whether he was waiting months, potentially years, but every day, waiting for a moment. And then one day he sees his boy in the distance, disfigured, but recognisably his son. And he can't help himself. He hitches up his robes and he starts running. And the reason he hitches up his robes, he knows if the people of the village get to the threshold of the village first, they're gonna perform the Kezazar ceremony, cut him off from the community. So he's like, I've got to get there first. He starts sprinting to his son. His son begins the speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father says, shut up. That's a paraphrase. That's the message translation. Shut up. And he throws his arms around his boy. And he puts a signet ring on his finger, which is a symbol of sonship. And his cloak around his shoulder is a symbol of sonship and basically communicates in his actions, I love you, you're my son. You were lost, you are found, you were dead, you're alive to me again. And they have this moment of embrace. How amazing is that? Now the crowd, listening to Jesus tell the story, there would have been a question at the forefront of their minds. What kind of father would do that? Remember first century culture, Middle Eastern culture, honour, shame culture. What kind of father would humiliate himself publicly and embrace his son after the son had brought such shame on him and the wider community? And this is Jesus operating as a prophet, basically saying, that's what your dad is like. You rejected your father. You ended up in a far off land. You're trying to get home. But here's the good news. Your father is so gracious, so kind, so merciful. He would hitch up his robes and start running to embrace you again. My hunch is that many people listen to the story and were like, whew. Gosh, amazing, amazing, but not fully understand it. 
But within a matter of maybe months, they would see Jesus stripped naked and beaten and spat upon and publicly humiliated and nailed to a cross with his arms stretched open, which is the posture of welcome, the posture of embrace. And maybe at that point, they're like, ah, I get it. In Jesus, the Father has come running to welcome us home. And maybe they remembered the words of Jesus that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is what your father is like. Like you don't need to strive or earn the embrace through good deeds, moral behaviour. He's running towards you by his spirit and he wants to pour out his love upon you. Now, can I tell you a moment when head knowledge became heart knowledge for me when it comes to understanding the love of the Father? So I was in my mid-20s a couple of years ago. It's a joke, it was 20 years ago. Anyway, um, and I'd gone through something that was incredibly painful and I actually needed some help processing the pain. So I ended up seeing a counsellor. Now, what happens when you go and see a counsellor, you spend a few weeks sort of like talking about things, like skirting around the core issue, the core wound. And then there's a moment where the counsellor, with great delight, hits the jackpot and finds where the real wound is. It was about week four for me. And the counsellor, I think, could discern what was going on in my innermost being. And he asked me this question. He said, Pete, do you have any memories of experiencing shame when you were a child? And I said, no. He said, you didn't even think about it. He said, have a little think. I just want you to just think. Any memories come to mind of experiencing shame as a child? So I had a minute and I just pondered it. And a couple of things came to mind, but they didn't feel hugely significant. So after a minute, I said, nothing really came to mind, which is an open door for a counsellor, right? Nothing really. So there was something. Well, tell me what the something was. He wasn't that sinister, don't worry. Um, So I basically said, and as I said these words, I expected to laugh as the words came out of my mouth. Instead, I started weeping. I said, at the age of 12, I still used to wet my bed. And suddenly I start weeping. We're talking ugly crying. We're talking snot flying every direction, right? Now, I want you to know that I've been controlling that magic muscle for over 30 years, something I'm incredibly proud of, thank you. So I'm worthy of applause, (laughs) worthy of applause. But as I say this to the counsellor, all the memories come flooding back. As a 12-year-old being on a football tour with the county team, We were travelling to the northern counties, playing different teams there and one night on tour. And even at the age of 12, that kind of toxic masculinity culture was kicking in and I wet my bed on tour. And I had to find the football coach in the morning without waking up any of the other kids. And I said, look, I'm really embarrassed. I'm really sorry I've wet the bed. And he was really angry and frustrated and I just felt shame. I remember waking up one morning. I went for a sleepover at my best mate's house, Clive's house, and I woke up in a wet bed. It's like, ah, why does this keep happening? And I get out of bed, don't want to wake Clive up. I find his dad and I say, look, this is really embarrassing. I'm really sorry, but I've wet the bed. And he looked really disappointed and frustrated and I felt an incredible amount of shame. When you experience shame, It is like swallowing the lie that you're unworthy of love. And people respond to shame in different ways. Here's how I responded as a young kid. This is all subconscious. I was like, I'm going to prove them wrong. I've experienced this shame, swallowing this lie that I'm unworthy of love. I'm going to prove to the world that I am worthy of love and I'm going to prove it by being a success. So I began to equate success with love. So I became incredibly driven when it came to academia, doing well in my exams. I was very driven when it came to sport, like trying to accomplish great things. When I went into ministry, I took the same mindset into ministry. I want to preach great sermons, be a great leader. Because if I If I taste success, I will prove to the world that I'm worthy of love. Because deep down, 
there was this experience, in fact, a number of experiences of shame, whispering to me, you're unworthy of love. You're unworthy of love. This moment in my mid-20s, I was exhausted. I was broken. I'd been striving for approval, desperately trying to taste more and more success. And in this room with the counsellor, I was sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. I believe the Spirit of God was in that place, yeah? And the love of the Father was being poured out upon me. And at the deepest part of my being, this voice began to emerge. You're free and you are loved. You're free and you are loved. I preached the story of the prodigal son at a church in the Southwest a couple of years ago. And I told the story of the prodigal son. I told the story of the bedwetting. And this lady in her mid 80s comes to me at the end of the, the talk and she says, do you mind if I have a quick chat with you? So we go to the side of the room and we sit down. And she says, can I tell you a story that I've never told anyone before? But it just emerged as you were preaching and I, I feel like I need to share it with someone. Would you mind listening? So I said, look, more than happy to listen. She said, when I was six years old, my mum and dad took me to a dinner party with their friends at the dinner party, there was loads of different guests and I lost mum and dad and I was in the living room. I needed the toilet, but I didn't feel safe enough to ask any of the other adults where the toilet was. I froze in a moment of paralysis and I wet myself. And this gentleman came to find me, <clears throat> took me by the hand to find my mum and dad. And before he took me to my mum and dad, he looked me in the eye and said, you're a disgusting little girl. This lady <clears throat> in her mid 80s telling me the story basically said, Pete, for all my life, I've lived with this internal voice that no one knows about that constantly speaks over me. You're a disgusting little girl. And to hear the story of a father who would hitch up his robes and come running to find me in the place of my greatest shame she said, well, that's just too good to be true. Could you pray that now in my mid 80s, I would encounter the love of the Father? So at the side of this room, placed my hand upon her and said, come Holy Spirit. And she began to encounter the love of God. Amazing moment to be a part of. One final story. <clears throat> One final story. I preached this sermon at a church in Portland, Oregon. I preached it a few times just to let you know. And, um, and at the end of the service, this couple came up to the front and said, look, could we ask your advice? They said, look, we've got a daughter who's 12 and she wets the bed too. And every night when she calls and we go through and she's wet the bed, we feel a level of frustration, exasperation. And we're pretty sure that our daughter is beginning to feel that, be aware of our exasperation. And we think she's beginning to feel real shame about the bedwetting. And we just wondered if you were in our shoes, what would you do? Now, this was a key moment for me because I, I realised I'd become a bedwetting expert. Now, I, when I was your age, I wasn't like, when I grow older, I want to be a bedwetting expert. There are very few people with that profession. There's a gap in the market and I'm going for it. Um, but I realised, gosh, I wasn't really trained in this area, but I began to offer some advice. And the advice I offered, to this day, I'm still fairly shocked that I offered this advice. I'm almost certain they didn't follow through on it. But this is what I said to this couple. I said, if I were you, next time it happens and you hear this voice, Daddy, I would go through, and before you communicate any of your frustration, and before you even change the sheets, I would get into that bed with her and lie in the urine-soaked sheets. You should have seen their face. Like, are you mad? You Brits are crazy. I was like, because I honestly think that's what God would do. And more than that, that is what God did. He entered the place 
of our greatest shame. This is the message of the cross. He made his home there and spoke at the cross a better word over us, a stronger word than our shame. You are free and you are loved. All the New Testament writers hang on this theme. Like the Apostle John, as he writes, this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is how we know what love is, that Christ died for us. This is what Paul prays over the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter three, that we would grab hold of a little bit more of the height, the width, the depth of this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God, like that this wouldn't just be head knowledge, but head knowledge would become heart knowledge and it would transform you from the inside out. My simple message is this. We are living in a culture and the culture tells you, you are to construct for yourself an identity, right? You pick the labels, like the clothes that you wear, take this label, take that label. And if you've got this label, you'll belong to this group, that label, you belong to this group. And we create and construct identities at great price. But you are being offered an identity that's beyond your wildest dreams and it's given to us freely in Jesus. You are free and you are loved. And when head knowledge becomes heart knowledge, it transforms you from the inside out.